I've never been much of an outdoor person, but the summer after my second year in college, one of my roommates convinced me to go tent camping with him. It was only over the weekend, and I wasn't doing anything anyway, so I said I'd go with him. For the sake of privacy, I'll call him Jake. Now, Jake would go all out. He had a 2014 Jeep Wrangler, the entire back seat filled almost completely with different camping gear. He didn't like to reserve spots at actual campsites, but instead find his own spots, which he said made it more fun. We drove up into the Rocky Mountains for a while until we found a break in the trees with enough space to fit the Jeep through. We then drove off-road between trees until they pointed out a good spot. We set up a fire pit, chairs, and the tent we'd be staying in for the night. It was already around 7pm and the sun was starting to set. Jake went to the car and pulled out a bag of hot dogs for us to cook over the fire. Real original, I know, but they were an easy meal, and plus Jake wanted to give me the true camping experience seeing it was my first time. He even brought stuff for s'mores. Although, we never got that far. As we were cooking the hot dogs, this extremely loud female screaming from maybe three or four hundred feet away echoed out throughout the trees. I looked up and saw Jake's head turn around behind him towards the direction of the screams. At first, there weren't any words we could make out, but then there was a help, a please, and a no, all of them sounding more desperate than the last. Then, the loudest, most terrifying scream was abruptly cut off mid-scream. Jake looked back in my direction. The look on his face was pure horror. As far as we knew, the closest man-made structure was the road, and even that was far away. No one should have been out here. Whatever it was that we just heard didn't even matter. We knew we needed to leave as fast as possible. We started frantically throwing things in the back of the jeep. We stuffed the still fully made tent inside as we closed the door. I tried calling 911 as we started driving back to the road. I had practically no service out there, but somehow still managed to get on the line with an operator. I did my best to explain what we heard, and they said they'd send out a trooper as soon as possible. It probably took us twice as long to get back to the road, just because this time we couldn't see anything. Finally, we saw the pavement, and stopped for a second. We didn't know if we should wait for the cops or not. That's when we saw a figure walking out from the trees in front of us. He was wearing jeans with an all-black sweatshirt, the hood covering his face. He was dragging something behind him in a heavy sheet or some kind of bag. His head was down, laying almost limp as he walked. He looked over in our direction when blue and red police lights revealed themselves down the road. The man turned his head and started sprinting back into the forest, letting go of the bag. The police saw this and started chasing after him. The bag he was dragging turned out to contain the remains of a 34-year-old woman. We don't know if he was ever caught. So, this happened when I was in middle school. It was summer and my parents had signed me up for a month-long all-boys summer camp. The campsite was exactly what you're imagining, six or seven small cabins spread out in the forest. There was a small lake, a few fire pits set up, and I think there was even a sand volleyball court if I'm remembering right. It was close to four hours out of town. The place was old and run down, but definitely still used often for summer camps. When we got there, I unpacked all my stuff into one of the cabins and set up my bed. Some of the kids I'd be staying with wanted to check out the forest before we'd have to be back for dinner. The rules of the camp were pretty laid back. We were told we could go as far as we wanted as long as we could still see the cabins. As we were walking into the forest, one of the kids pointed something out, or rather someone. A man who had to be over 50 years old stood a few yards away looking in our direction. He looked almost homeless, really unkempt, you know, dirty clothes, a rough gray beard. We ultimately just assumed he was one of the camp counselors. The guy gave us a weird smile, and I gave him an awkward wave back. We ran back to our cabin, and later that night told one of the camp counselors about it. They took it very seriously, even going out to that part of the woods themselves, but by then the guy was gone. We started to realize that a large portion of the camp counselors were teenagers. No one was older than like 30. They didn't tell this straight to our faces, but it didn't seem like they had any idea who that man was. The 
next few days, we didn't do much more exploring. We were still pretty creeped out, to be honest with you. It was on the fourth night when things really hit the fan. I was sleeping and woke up to the sound of the cabin door handle rattling. Now, most nights at 11 p.m., one of the counselors would knock on all the cabins to remind the kids to lock their doors and go to sleep. Sometimes we would fall asleep before this and it would end up waking us up. I thought this is what was happening, but I didn't have any way to tell the time, so I had no way of knowing. Being the only one awake, I felt obligated to yell out a response. I'm pretty sure I yelled out something about how we were already in bed. Right as I did this, a flashlight turned on from outside and the light started pointing in through the windows. Someone was trying to see inside. By then, a couple of the other kids started to wake up. I remember motioning for them to get down. The person outside went around the cabin multiple times, pointing the light through every window as they did so. I don't know if they saw me, but I do know the light passed clear over me a good couple of times. After maybe five minutes, the light finally turned off and everything once again returned to silence. I explained what happened to the other kids. One of them had a watch and looked at it. It was 4 a.m. That wasn't a counselor. We stayed awake until morning. Finally, one of the teenage counselors came to our cabin to wake us up for breakfast. Right away, we told him what happened and he stopped. He took us to a couple of the adult counselors where we retold the story. What we heard next was something that truly terrified us. Last night, a kid from a different cabin had gone for a walk to use the bathroom. As he was heading back, he noticed someone at our cabin door. Like us, he at first thought it was a counselor, but questioned this when he saw the person trying to pick the lock. The kid was asked to describe the man. It was dark, however, he remembered him having a beard and wearing dirty clothes. This instantly reminded me of the man we had seen in the forest on the first day. The entire camp immediately got cancelled in concern of kids' safety. That afternoon, a bus showed up and took all of us back home. Many years have passed since this happened. I recently did my own research and was able to find a small report on it. Police were called in after we had left. They combed the area and found a small tent nearby. Inside were the essentials, along with hundreds of Polaroid pictures of the camp. The cabins, the canoes by the lake, the fire pits, everything. Among these were pictures of the kids, most of them taken from a distance or in a place where the man taking them was clearly trying to hide. Most disturbing were the pictures taken at night through cabin windows. The police waited for someone to return to the tent, but no one ever did. The man was never found. It was approaching the end of summer and my wife and I wanted to go on a camping trip before it started getting cold out again. I had a ton of camping gear left over from when I used to go with college buddies and wanted to put it back to use. There was one spot we always used to go. It wasn't even technically a camping ground, just a cool spot we had found one time that I thought would be perfect to take my wife. When we got there, we noticed a makeshift fire pit and some trash left behind, so obviously other people had found the spot, but we didn't really care. We set up the tent we'd be staying in and started a fire. We sat around the fire talking and drinking for hours on end. Suddenly, at around 2am, we were interrupted by the sound of a chainsaw starting and revving up. Or at least that's exactly what it sounded like. Our first thought was that someone was cutting down a tree, but we didn't understand why someone would be doing that this late in the night. This theory was quickly thrown out when this maniacal laughing suddenly followed. Now we were creeped out. We put out the fire and got inside our tent. It sounded distant, so we felt somewhat safe. Plus, we had a machete if it really came to that. Over the next few minutes, it honestly sounded like the noises were getting closer. But thankfully, the engine, or whatever it was, abruptly cut out and a wave of relief overcame us. After a half hour of silence, the two of us felt comfortable enough to try and fall asleep. And surprisingly, we actually did relatively quickly, most likely in part due to the drinks we had earlier. I don't know what time it was, but at some point during the night, I remember opening my eyes, 
confused as to what woke me up. As my senses were coming back to me, the sound of footsteps filled my ears. I sat up to listen better and noticed my wife had already done the same. We sat there looking at each other, listening. There were multiple sets of footsteps. It sounded like no more than 20 yards away. My wife suggested we make a run for the car. I told her we should wait a few minutes. It was light out that night from the moon, and behind her I could see the silhouettes of three men on the tent wall. I didn't tell her this, the last thing I wanted to do was scare her, but I did get a firm grip on the machete laying next to us, although I was horrified at the thought of actually having to use it on someone. I sat there watching the shadows. Seconds felt like hours. Finally, after what was realistically only a couple minutes, I saw them walk off. This was our chance. I told my wife it was time to go. Leaving everything behind, I opened the tent and we full on sprinted to the car. I've never been more thankful to have a remote start key fob. I started the engine as we were running and right as we got inside, I floored it out of there. That's when I told my wife about the shadows on the tent wall and she laid into me for not telling her earlier. We spent the night in a hotel. The next morning we went back to the camp. All of our stuff was gone. Not a single thing was left behind. I still don't know what really went down that night. A part of me thinks we were just unknowingly on someone else's private property and that was their sick way of getting us off of it. But it's possible those people meant real harm to us. Either way, they now have all of our camping gear. However, I don't see us going camping again anytime soon. <laughs>